Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalam ala sayyidil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Wa man tabi'um bi ihsanin ila yaumidin wa ba'd Alhamdulillah we continue With another one of our series of hadith And Alhamdulillah today we will be doing the hadith Which is referred to as Hadith Jibreel the hadith of Inj Jibreel salam because Jibreel salam came in the presence of companions radiallahu anhum to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked some questions so before I get into details of the hadith I will read the translation of the hadith and it is a very long hadith and inshallah I hope with our short time our short video I will be able to do some justice by summarizing the hadith it is not sufficient in a day if you are to ask many scholars they will this hadith they go days with explanation because of how tremendous and virtuous this hadith is so inshallah I hope and pray by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he help us that we can do some sort of justice so the hadith goes Narrated by Abdullah ibn narrated by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu he says while we were sitting in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black hair. No traces of journey were visible on him as none of us knew who this person was. So this man came, he sat close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he rested his knee, he placed his knee against the knee of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is that you should testify that there was no deity but Allah <coughs> and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. That you should perform salah, your prayer, you should pay zakah, you should fast during the month of Ramadan and you should perform Hajj to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you find a way to it, if you find a means to it. The man responded, the person who came in the presence respond, you have spoken truly. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu he said, we were astonished at thus this man questioning someone, questioning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and with the response of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also acknowledged and he said, you have spoken the truth. So the man continued asking the question, he, he said, O oh Muhammad, inform me about Iman, inform me about faith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered, it is that you, Faith is that you believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and in the last day. And you believe in Qadr, in faith, both in his good and in his evil aspect. The man responded, you have spoken truly. Then he continued asking, Inform me about Ihsan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered, Ihsan is that you should serve Allah as though you could see him. For though you cannot see him, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Then the man continued, he asked, Inform me about the final hour. Inform me about when the day of judgment will take place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, he says, the one who has been questioned knows no more than the one who is asking the question. So the person continues with the question and he said, So tell me about the signs of this hour of the Day of Judgment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Among his signs is that a slave girl will beget her mistress and that you will see barefoot, naked, destitute, orphan, shepherd competing with each other in construction of building. Umar radiallahu anhu narrates, after this the person departs and after some time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him, O oh, Umar, do you know who this questioner was? Umar radiallahu anhu replied, Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows best. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied that it was Jibreel alayhi salam that came to teach you of your religion. So <clears throat> this hadith subhanallah um, I try to give a translation of it in a jest so that we do not take up much time 
but this hadith it includes within it all outwardly and inwardly actions outwardly and outwardly actions and inwardly beliefs the science of sharia of islamic law return back to this hadith due to its encompassing knowledge of the sunnah hence due to this reason some of the scholars term this hadith as the mother or the core of sunnah just as surah fatiha is referred to the mother of the quran the core of the quran uh, because the message contained there it contains the entire message of the quran so jibrail hadith jibrail hadith given the name hadith jibrail is also refer to as scholars as the mother or the core of the sunnah so we see in this hadith as umar radiallahu anhu he started off he said bainama nahnu bainama julusun in the rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that while we were sitting rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam suddenly this man appeared so scholars have explained that you know such a sudden and unexpected appearance by jibreel alayhi salam was to draw the attention of the companions alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam towards a conversation which was to take place between Jibreel and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and by them by their attention being drawn towards the conversation they will be able to remember it more clearly and that no one but Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam know and recognize who the visitor was it will increase the curiosity and their interest in this person and whatever they want to ask and <clears throat> this set of question that he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam responded to those questions and then he addressed his companions then he addressed his companions as in to tell them remind them who this visitor was so there are few and quite a few lessons from this hadith and as i mentioned we will get into a summary of it and from this hadith we see one lesson we learned is that the awareness of the companions alayhi wasallatu wassalam and the narrator of this hadith specifically umar radiallahu anhu we learned from his awareness in this hadith and this is an important aspect and an important point for islamic workers or those who are involved in islamic da'wah that they should be aware of their surroundings and to recognize as muslims for us to recognize what is going on around us so that we can act appropriately umar radiallahu anhu when narrating the hadith we can see that he noticed it was just the, the visitor was a well-kept individual with clean clothes he did not know this person he but he could address he said he speak about the person describe the person that he was his dress was so neat his hair was not even disheveled as a sign of journey there were no traces of travel on him. Umar radiallahu anhu was very conscious about this. He could sense that this man was not an ordinary man. Nor was he a man from Arang Tang, Arang the area, Arang Medina. The call towards Islam is a very much predicate, predicated upon the building of relationship among those we are surrounded with, among the people around us. The people who care about inviting others to Islam and spreading the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should notice also what is going on around them and that is something very important a lesson that is also taken out from this hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam as we see from Umar radiallahu anhu's narration another aspect another lesson that is taken out is that of etiquette etiquette and manners Jibreel alayhi salam he came dressed in a very nice and clean way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the hadith Inna Allah jameelu yuhabbu jamal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran فَأَمَّا بِالنِّعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ As for the bounties of your Rabb whatever bounty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon you you speak about it which means you don't have to literally verbally go and speak but you also show if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you that you can dress neatly that you can dress appropriately you dress in a state of tahara and a, a means of people being comfortable around you then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is from the part of fahadith you propagate it you speak about it you show from the bars mercy and blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with 
So from the etiquette of Jibra'il Islam, when he came, he was not dressed disheveled, he was not dressed unappropriate that, you know, people consider him to be that of a Bedouin even. He came to Prophet Sallallahu just neatly, in a very respectful and in a very humble way. <coughs> when he sat to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not just sit anyhow, he didn't just sit in any way, but also he humbled himself regards to a person who seeking knowledge or a person who is asking question. He sat with his knees, touching the knees of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From this also scholars have took many, many things in regards in terms of seeking knowledge from this hadith. And among that is that students should be decent, they should look clean as much as possible, and they should show a high level of respect towards the teachers. As Jibreel alayhi salam, when he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though scholars have agreed that him, him asking these questions was not because he wanted to know, but was a form of teaching those companions around Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about their Islam. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered and he told, Rasul, he told Umar radiallahu anhu at the end of the hadith that it was Jibreel alayhi salam came to teach you your deen. But yet, as a fact that he was not a real student that did not know these answers but yet he showed the humbleness so that students and learners of deen can also implement these aspects. Another lesson here is that the outward action and the inward beliefs. <coughs> Jibreel Islam turns to the Prophet وسلم, and he says tell me about Islam. When Rasulullah answered regarding to Islam his answer was centered around outward action. Then Jibreel Islam asked the Prophet about Iman and the Prophet answered focus on internal actions and belief. <clears throat> the terms Islam and Iman are normally used interchangeably for faith, for belief. Whenever someone uses Iman, Islam, that is general. We understand it to be faith or we understand it to be belief. But in this hadith, they were used in their, in, in their linguistically, in their exact linguistic sense and meaning Islam which means submission Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the answer regarding the submission is that Islam is the forms of the pillars the five pillars of Islam Iman on the other hand refers to internal belief or conviction of the heart and hence when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked a question Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered explaining those tenets of faith that are formed what are formed belief from the heart so within these questions there were three things that was asked and the scholars refer to it as the big three which is islam iman and ihsan and scholars consider these three as three stages to the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the path to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to achieve closeness towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first path which is islam is that you force yourself and bring yourself to do those actions which you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. The second level which is that of Iman is where you are not only doing those actions but you are strengthening your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're beginning to taste the sweetness of Iman. You're beginning to taste the sweetness of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why people refer to the term you know you taste the sweetness of Iman because every act you're doing you're tasting that love and you have that shawk, that desire towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue doing good deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third level is the level of ihsan, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verily, we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us. We are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing us. So... We are moving in this path, in this journey towards the divine, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in doing so, it's getting more and more intense. Next question Jibreel alayhi salam asked was regarding to the sa'ah, regarding to the hour, the hour of the day of judgment. When Jibreel alayhi salam asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his first question was, Mata sa'ah, when is the hour, when is the final day, when is that day of judgment? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's response was that, the one who was asking the question, which is Jibreel asking Rasulullah the question, 
the one who was asking the question does not know much more than the one who was being asked. Which means both parties don't know the question, don't know the answer to the question. So Rasulullah Sallam said, the one being asked about it is not more knowledgeable than the one who is asking. So here Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam giving that answer is saying that this is something from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, a knowledge that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala kept to Himself, which referred to Ilm Al Ghaib. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, this is one of the knowledge from the five knowledge that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentioned in the Quran, in Allah Indahu Ilm Al Saa, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has the knowledge. His unseen knowledge is that of the time of the day of judgment. So, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he is telling us that it is an important lesson because it doesn't matter when the day of judgment is for us to know. What really matter is what and how are we preparing for the day of judgment. Knowing the time frame is not important. We know it has to come. Whenever it is, that's not important. What are we preparing for that time? What are we preparing for that day or the final day when we have no more time to do any action in this world? We should continue to strive to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to seek His forgiveness. That is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at one instant when he was asked by a companion, by a companion that when is the time of judgment, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked him, what have you prepared for it? The companion responded, I have not prepared much except that I love Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him so beautifully that you will be from among those whom you love. That if you love Allah and you love His Prophet and you throw up on that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you companionship of those people on the day of judgment. So after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divorced the point that it's not important, he doesn't know the knowledge. No one knows of his knowledge of the day of judgment. He was asked, what are the signs? Inform me of some signs. Just bear in mind and remind ourselves that the signs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in this hadith are not the only signs he have mentioned. But he have mentioned of some signs which is apparent for the companions who was present so they could have known and was made aware of it. So Jibreel Islam asked, tell me about the signs. Tell me about the things that will occur towards those time coming to show the day of judgment. And these signs are a form of warning. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave two signs. And one of them is a slave woman will give birth to her master. And the tense which was used here is Rabbataha, which is a female, as a feminine tense. So it's referring to a female master. And one of the interpretation of this hadith related to a modern time will be that the one who gives birth is supposed to be in power but or is supposed to have some sort of level of authority over the one whom she gives birth to. But on the other hand, here it is flipping the scale. The one who gives birth becomes the servant of the one who is born, which means a mother gives birth and the child that the mother gives birth becomes a master. And there are so many ways we can interpret this in our time that the child is ruling the parent, the child is disobedient to the parents, and the child is, is disrespectful to the parent. So, whereas before the child was meant, or the child is meant to be respectful towards the parent, honor the parent, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the dua that we make to in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned also the dua that we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi Hamhuma Kama Rabbi Yani Sagira, that Allah grant mercy to the boat as a grave us mercy, and uh, grant us mercy when we were small. So merciful and respected honor is something that is true for our parent. Because of the difficulties that they went through in growing us up and in a mother go through and giving birth to a child. So in reality, it was meant to show respect and honor to our parents, to our mother specifically. But today, we see that the opposite, the complete opposite is happening. And if you look around, you see how, as if parents are slave to the child. And if parents are burdened to the children, parents are desperately trying to please their children instead of it being the opposite. And the moms, the mothers are trying to imitate their daughters. So the second sign Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in this hadith is that of barefooted, lightly dressed people who dress poorly and they are poor at wealth and they are shepherds because generally people who are shepherds are considered to be among the desert Arabs and the desert people they are people considered to be poor people. But you will see people of these status and people of this stature 
Do you see they compete with one another and build in lofty buildings and high rank buildings and massive mansions? And here the point was also so I'm telling you that these people have nothing. They are very poor. But then suddenly situation change and then they are they become so wealthy and now they are starting to compete with one another in building it and having the most fanciest stuff and the fanciest ornaments and things in this world. And we have seen this again predominantly in our time. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us from falling to the categories of these two signs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted. And regarding to all of this in the end, it is all from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us so much, but rather for us as mankind to be humble, rather for us to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, um, will increase us more and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us more in this world and the hereafter which our striving is for eternally. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wala in shakartum la azidannakum. That verily, if you are grateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase you. But instead, mankind today, we have become arrogant and we think that all that we have got, it is from us. It is due to our hard earnings. Righteousness, put in full effort and trying one best will eventually what lead one to success. To true success, to wealth, our success in this world and the hereafter, it all depends on our righteousness and our full effort and trying our best towards achieving goodness. But at the end of the day, we still have to acknowledge that no matter how much effort we put in, our wealth and our success will always be in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will always be from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being successful, having wealth, having children, having parents, shall give us more reasons to increase our humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and increase our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he help us that we can we could have derived some lessons from this hadith and like I've said I've tried to summarize it in in, in short points as much as possible may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to grant us the ability that we can comprehend may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for my shortcomings in narrating the scene of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and if there is anything good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may we all benefit from it. Aqulu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Jazakum Allah khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.